Hello and welcome to lecture two of the energy unit in Phys 1101 and in this one we're going to look at some simple cases where we can use conservation of energy and then I'll just set up the case where things get not so simple and we'll start looking at that in the next lecture. At the end of the last lecture we saw that this funny expression here half mv squared plus mgy turned out in free fall to be constant. And so we identified this constant as our total energy and this piece here, the half mv squared, is our kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and this mgy is an energy of height, our gravitational potential energy. Let me just warn you that this is really only true in cases where gravity is the only force doing work. Now for now we know that's free fall but as we'll see there are other cases as well where this is true. In other words other cases where gravity is the only force doing work. But until we have a better definition of work we won't really be able to figure out when that's so. My other comment is that I very blithely multiplied through by m saying that I was doing it because I felt like it. But of course that's not true. I was multiplying through by m because I knew the m had to be there. And just think about it. If you are using a hammer, a light hammer has less capacity to do work on a nail than a heavy hammer does, right? It won't drive the nail as far uh, if it's going the same speed. So it's fairly clear that the energy should depend and we will eventually see using our definition of work that it works like this. Let's carry out a unit analysis quickly. So look at the kinetic energy, the mass is in kilograms, the speed here is in meters per second, and so we get kilograms times meters per second all squared. And if you look at the gravitational potential energy you have the mass in kilograms, g is an acceleration so it's in meters per second squared, this y here is a distance so it's in meters, and either way you come up with the same units, right? You have to because you have to be able to add these together so they must have the same units, and it's kilogram meters squared per second squared, and we're going to define that as the joule, which is our unit of energy. Let's return to this case of me throwing a ball up into the air, but let's now do it with numbers and see how we can use this to solve for things. So let's say that when the ball leaves my hand it's going up at 10 meters per second. And I've set my axes down on the floor, and let's say that at the moment it leaves my hand it's a meter above the ground. And for whatever reason we're interested in how fast this ball is going when it's 3 meters above the ground. So I'm going to start by drawing an energy bar chart, and so I'm talking about an initial time and a final time, so this is just one and two, and we know that initially it's got a lot of kinetic energy, so I'll call that K1, and it's got not an, not an awful lot of gravitational potential energy, so I'll call that UG1. And then later at time 2 it's got less kinetic energy and more gravitational potential energy. And we know in free fall that the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy are constant, or they add up to a constant, the total energy. So K1 plus UG1 equals K2 plus UG2. And notice how I've lined that up. Under, I mean, I'm really just taking my energy bar chart and I'm converting it into this formula. So the energy bar chart is just a visual way of getting your conservation of energy equation. Well, now we can just replace each of these with the formulas for the different types of energy. 
the kinetic energy is a half m, and I'll call that v1 squared, and the gravitational potential energy is mg, and I'll call this y1. And the kinetic energy after, or later, is a half m v2 squared, and that plus the gravitational potential energy mg y2. And so now we want v2. We want to know how fast this is going at the end, so I'm just going to solve for that. So So I've come up with 7.75 meters per second. Now, look at this. I could have done all of this using uniformly accelerated motion methods that we've known for weeks and weeks now. So you could be forgiven at this point for thinking that energy methods aren't very useful. But we will eventually see how they're useful in all sorts of cases where we can't use uniformly accelerated motion. Still staying with this example just a little while longer, let's notice one more thing about it. So if we think about the time when y3 is the same as y1, in other words, when the ball has returned to its original height, then since y1 and y3 are the same, that tells us that the gravitational potential energies at times 1 and 3 are the same. And since the total energy is a constant, that tells you that the kinetic energies at time 1 and time 3 must also be equal. But notice the velocities v3 and v1 are not the same because they're in opposite directions. But this is telling you that while those velocities are in the opposite directions, the speeds are the same because the kinetic energy doesn't care about the direction of the velocity. It only cares about speed. Energy is a scalar. And so the kinetic energy, when I write it this way, note there's no vector symbol on that V, and I haven't put anything in bold. This is a scalar expression. That V there is a speed, not a velocity. Similarly, when you look at the gravitational potential energy, that Y is not a position which would be a vector. It's the vertical component of the position. And while vectors are made out of components, components themselves are scalars. Let's see how energy being a scalar can save you a lot of work. So quite some time ago, we were doing projectile motion. And so here's a typical sort of projectile situation to think about. I throw this ball. I'm at the top of cliff or something. The ball is initially 8 meters above the ground. I throw it at 10 meters per second, angled 60 degrees above the horizontal. And let's say we want to know its speed, speed, not velocity, its speed just before hitting the ground. Well, you know, you could work through this with uh, projectile motion methods that we've learned, but it would take you a little while because you'd have to worry about the x component of v, which is constant, and then a y component, and so on. And the y component is varying. But if we use energy, we can sort of cut through a lot of that detail. We know it starts with some amount of kinetic energy. We also know that before it hits the ground, it's lower down. It should be going faster. And I've set my axes up here, so my initial value of y is 0. So I can say that the gravitational potential energy at time 1 is 0. The gravitational potential energy at time 2, well, that's at a negative y, so that's going to come out negative. There's nothing wrong with a potential energy being negative. It's a scalar, but it can be positive or negative. And so we can now just go ahead and write our conservation of energy. K1 equals K2 
plus UG2. And now let's solve for V2 out of here. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this as a half M V1 squared equals a half M V2 squared plus MGY2, although I'll note that Y2 is a negative number. And like before, the masses are going to cancel. And I'm going to go ahead and solve for V2. And I come up with 16.1 meters per second. Notice that because energy is a scalar, I could just ignore the 60 degrees. All I care about is the speed. There is the initial speed. And so I was able to just use it and solve straight for the speed just before the ball hits the ground. Now, on the other hand, if I wanted to know what angle it was going at, just before it hit the ground, I'd have some more work to do, and energy wouldn't be very good at that. This is the trade-off. Energy is insensitive to direction, so if you don't care about energy, about direction, energy will save you a lot of work. But if you do need to know information about directions, energy is not a good way to get it. The situation where energy is going to turn out to be really important is when we have forces that depend on position. So let's now take a look at one of the simplest examples of that. Way, way back, we saw spring forces, and we've hardly talked about them at all since then. So let's get a bit of a review. A spring force always acts back towards the equilibrium. And what I mean is that any spring has an equilibrium length, the length that it has when no forces are being exerted on it. But if you pull on a spring so that it stretches, so the displacement of the end of the spring points in some direction. Then the spring pulls back on your hand. That's what we call the spring force, the force that the spring exerts on you. And that spring force points back towards the equilibrium position. And similarly, if you push on the spring so that your displacement is like so, then the spring force again pushes back towards the equilibrium position. We call this a restoring force. In other words, the spring force is always in the opposite direction to the displacement vector for the end of the spring. Now, the other thing we know about spring forces is that when you pull on a spring, then it pulls back. And if you pull it so that it stretches longer, in other words, if you increase the displacement of the end of the spring, it pulls back with a larger force. So the, the amount of force, the magnitude of the spring force, depends on the magnitude of the displacement of the end of the spring. And similarly, if you compress it, you get the same thing. The amount you compress it affects how large the spring force is. And so we say that the spring force is proportional to the displacement, and there's this constant, which is a property of the individual spring, which gets called the spring constant. I, I don't like the name spring constant. I, I don't think it's descriptive enough. I think it would be better if we call it the stiffness of the spring, because that's really what it describes. Or if you write it as a vector relation, now you have to include the fact that the spring force points in the opposite direction to the displacement vector for the end of the spring. And so you need this negative sign out here, which is just saying that these two vectors are in opposite directions. So all the methods we know of at the moment deal with constant forces. But here, the spring force we see isn't constant. It changes with the length of the spring. So as we're going to see next lecture, this is the sort of situation where energy really comes in handy.